Ah, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Come on in and join us. It's warm inside. It's definitely not outside, but it is a lot warmer in here. So come on in. Uh, we're a little light, obviously, today. I think we've got some people that are, are out sick. We were just actually sitting here thinking about it. We got one, two, three families missing. Uh, man, we got and, and, and others. So it's, I uh, don't know if it's cold. don't know if it's just uh, illness, but we're praying for them. Uh, man, we're so glad to have you here. Welcome to Fellowship Church, Grand State. I am Pastor Aaron. I am the pastor and lead planter here at Fellowship Church. And we want to tell you, uh, man, if you're your first time here visiting, man, welcome. You are in the right place. We are so glad you're here as we gather together this Sunday morning to uh, praise our risen Savior. So if you are new here, I'd ask if you would, if it's your first time, or you may have even visited a couple times, go ahead and fill out one of those information cards. They're actually marking today's passage in the Pew Bibles, or they're back in the back. Uh, either way, you can grab them. Just let us know you're here, how we can pray for you. Uh, man, what brought you in? But we're so glad to have you guys here with us. Uh, a few announcements before we get started. Uh, our D-Life is still going on, so we've got our midweek service. And we've got, uh, that's on Thursday nights. We meet in the upper rooms up front here of the church on Thursdays at 630. Uh, we're continuing to go through the Old Testament, reading through five chapters a week, writing down how we're seeing God uh, in them, a sin to confess, a promise we can proclaim, uh, an attitude to change, a command to follow, or, an, or a command to obey, or an example to follow. Uh, it's been good. The, uh, the kids, I think, they're really getting involved. It sounds like they had great conversations as they are getting plugged in, and, and also the adults. So we'd love for you to join us on that on Thursday night, 6.30 to about 8 o'clock. Come on up. Uh, also, the men have a D-Life group that meets on Saturday mornings. I'd love for you to come join us on that. We meet at the Spot Eatery just down the road here. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been, we'd like to get you information on that, too. We're going through the New Testament uh, with the men. Same thing, five chapters a week, and spend some time discussing it. It's great. Uh, the guys that have been coming, there's about five of us so far. And, uh, man, I love it. I love hearing how God's working in each and one of their, every one of their lives. So uh, if you want some information on that, let us know. The women are still getting uh, their, their plan together on how they're going to serve, how they're going to engage with one another. And as we... Uh, as we find out more about that, we'll let you guys know. Uh, I know we don't have listed on here, but I do want to talk about, I think we're planning on an outreach event coming up here in February, February 17th, 17th I believe. We're going to do a homeless outreach. Yeah. Uh, we'll get more information by next week for you guys on that, but uh, kind of keep that on your radar. We're going to go and we're going to engage with the homeless in Manchester, uh, try and serve them here a little bit this uh, winter with some warm clothes and some other things. Uh, we'll need your guys' help. It's a great opportunity to pray with a bunch of people uh, that, that need praying for, uh, to love on a bunch of people that need loved on as we continue to strive to be a church that's for the city, for the kingdom, uh, not a church that's just about being inside these four walls. Uh, but our next service event is actually this Saturday. The Winter Carnival uh, that, that Hooks It puts on, we're going to be serving at it and uh, engaging with our community. So we've got a sign-up sheet at the back. I'm, I'm asking you guys, please, if you could sign up to, so I can plan as to how we're going to serve and be there. Uh, the, we need some people in parking lot duty a little bit and helping to set vendors up. Uh, so that, that's from like 8 to 9.30 or so. And then uh, we, we're looking for blocks of two hours between 10 and 3.30. Uh, where we can have people to sit there at our table. We're going to be handing out information, uh, handing out tracts. We can also just be inviting people to church, let them know what we're about. And the good thing is we're like the third table in, so as people come in, they have to come by us. They can't miss us. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a good time to come up there and serve. So uh, if you would, just fill out that, uh, that sign up there on the back table for us, please, so we can plan on it. Linda's going to do face painting, and we're going to need all hands on deck for this one. Uh, so come on up. It's, it's great. We've done it for many, many, many seasons now, except this time we get to be inside for it. Every year before, we've served outside in the parking lot. So. And we have a friendly church next to us. Yes, we do. We have one of our, our, yep. our friends that is also uh, yep. here in town. They're going to be just a couple booths down that we partner with a lot. Actually, we're going to talk about more that, about that. They are wanting to do another combined service. Uh, their people loved it. We loved it. So we're going to be talking about how can we do that again, bring both churches together here again, and uh, and just be united as, as the church uh, celebrating Christ. So uh, if you've missed any of the past uh, services, I, I encourage you to go online and watch them online. You also download on any of the podcasts. I've got uh, all the Book of Romans is on there now as we finished that up last fall. Uh, go ahead and you can go back and listen to some of our messages. But for those of you who call Fellowship home, man, we're glad you guys made it, that you made it through the cold you've endured. Uh, man, we're glad you're here. Uh, you can put your tithes and offerings in the back. You can do it online. Everything we do is because of you. All our outreaches that we do, uh, the way we engage with our community, it's all because of your generous giving. So, uh, man, uh, thank you guys so much for everything you do to, to help make this the church that it is because it's not me. That's not my family. It's you guys. 
You guys are the body of Christ. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to start our morning here in worship as we, uh, we lift our voices up to the Lord. So let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for a warm location. Lord, thank you for uh, just providing a place where we can come together in corporate worship, where we can come together as the body of Christ to celebrate you. Lord, everything that we do is because of you. And so we want to give all the glory to you, including the glory as we begin in worship. Uh, Lord, we pray that these songs are times for us to, to set our hearts towards you. Lord, use these songs as, as, as words to encourage us, words to help us to see how good you are, to see how loving you are, your grace and your mercy. Father, we're just so thankful for you. So, Lord, be with us today. We love you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could, I'd ask you please stand as we begin our first song of worship. Sealed the promise. 
He is our living hope. If it, if it wasn't for Christ and it wasn't for the, the work he did coming down to pay the price for our sins, there, there would be no hope for us. Uh, but because he stepped down from his place of glory, he was able to, to step across that chasm, that, that separation that sin had brought into our lives. And so we praise him. And it's because of his grace that God uh, blesses us with this gift of salvation. And so we have a new song this week that we want to introduce to you guys. I'm sure you've heard it if you've listened to it. Uh, and, but it's a, it's a great song that, sh- that talks about this view of, of God's grace. Uh, it's, a, it's a play off of, of course, the song Amazing Grace. But it is this is Amazing Grace. So join us as we sing this.
is. It is because of his amazing grace and all that he has done for us. To call us out of darkness and into life to call us uh, to, as we were once enemies and now he calls us children of the king. What an amazing gift. Uh, this, this song is one we've done from the very beginning. Uh, I love going back and singing these songs that are from the Psalms. Just make sure I'm on the right one. Uh, this, is, uh, this is out of Psalm 34. Uh, it's been no better things to sing than to sing actual God's words and the, what he has written to us in his, his Bible. So this is Psalm 34, Taste and See. I sought the Lord, and he answered me.
Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Um, thank you for the cold air on our faces and the warm sun on our backs, Lord. Um, just a reminder that you are so great and in control of everything, Lord, that you are creator of all from the very beginning. Uh, Lord, I just ask that your presence be felt here today. Lord, let the words that are spoken not be our own words, but, Lord, words that come from you that you desire us to hear today. Lord, I pray the message that is given um, speaks to our hearts, Lord, that it's exactly what we need to hear, Lord, to just convict our souls and transform us to look more like you and draw us closer to you. Um, I'm just so thankful for you, Lord. I'm thankful for your blessings, and uh, we are just so incredibly unworthy. And so today, we just give you all the glory and praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we get started here, so good to be back in here this morning. As we continue on looking at our spiritual fitness, uh, if you remember, we started a, a series here, just a short series. As the beginning of the year, everybody is trying to to build these these uh, these new uh, new what's the word I'm looking for? Habits. Resolutions. There's the word. Habits. That's the word. We're trying to trying to make ourselves better. Oftentimes, we're looking at financial resolutions. We're looking at health resolutions. But we want to look at spiritual resolutions. Our our spiritual resolution this year. Remember, this is what we're striving for: is to be closer to Christ. This is the year that, that as we continue persevering through these new steps, uh, we're drawing closer to Christ than we've ever been. And so last week we talked about prayer. I pray that you guys are continuing in that challenge that was offered up of finding 10 minutes a day to be in a place of, of solitude where you can just spend with the Lord, that you can talk to Him, you can hear Him, you can pour your heart out to Him and draw closer to Him because the, the Word tells us that God draws near to those who draw near to Him. And so praying you're taking that time with that. And so now we're going to move in to the scripture. We want to look at Bible study. I challenge you guys, if anybody did not pick up either of those pamphlets last week, the prayer booklet or the Bible in six months, they are on the back table. Please grab those. We want you to keep up with them. I know it can seem like a lot, like you're drinking from a, a, a fire hose at some times, but we want you to persevere through it. Because like we talked about, so many Christians actually will tell you that they have never fully read the entirety of God's word. Sammy, can you bring me down just a bump? I'm getting a, a little bit of feedback. That they're, they've never read all of God's word. And so we want to encourage you to be able to go through it. And yes, there's going to be times where it seems like it's a lot. But trust me, when you get to the parts that, that maybe you struggle with, maybe Leviticus, uh, maybe as you're going through uh, Kings and Chronicles, you'll be glad that you're going through it really fast. That way you can get through them and get on into some stuff that you really enjoy. Because uh, it can seem like a lot, but man, it is... It's a gift from God. Just like prayer is a gift that God has given to each one of us, uh, the ability to talk to our creator, the one who created our soul is able, now we can communicate with him. He's given us this gift of, of his word. And I can tell you, uh, I, I didn't truly understand what a gift this was. Uh, as most of you know, I was an atheist up in until about seven years ago when God called me out of darkness. Uh, and I knew just enough scripture to be dangerous. And even worse, I knew what I thought was scripture, but really it wasn't. But I don't think that was just me. I think there's a lot of Christians that think they know what's in God's word, but it's not. And I actually compiled a list here of some things that I want you to kind of just take a mental note and check and say, yeah, I've, I've said those things, or yeah, I've heard that. I thought that was in the Bible, but it's not. And I want to encourage you as we go through it. So some of these are uh, like, uh, this too shall pass. I hear many Christians say, oh, this too shall pass. Well, what will pass? The Bible many times says it came to pass, but nowhere does the scripture say that it too shall pass. I, I got news. When you're in a dark place, we pray that God will pull you out, but that doesn't mean that he's going to pull you out of that spot. There's no guarantee that it'll pass until you leave this earth. And there are people that are devout followers of Christ that suffer their entire lives still. Paul, Peter, John. All of the apostles, they suffered for Christ. It did not pass until they passed from this earth and into glory. How about this one? God works in mysterious ways. Oh, you know, something's going on. Well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Now, God's ways are different than our ways. The Bible tells us that his ways are very different from ours. But it doesn't say that they're mysterious. God's ways have been clear from the very beginning, from in the moment in the Garden of Eden when he told the serpent that I was going to send the seed that was going to crush you. 
God's ways have been clear. His ways have always been pointing towards the need for a Savior, a divine intervention from Christ to come onto this earth to be able to bring redemption to a lost and broken human, to each and every one of us. His ways are clear. We might not understand them. Sometimes we don't understand those ways because, again, his ways are so much different than ours. But they're not mysterious. This one here. I hear this one a lot. God loves the sinner but hates the sin. God hates sin but loves the sinner. That is not in the Bible. Yes, God loves us. When people say that, we have taken that and we've twisted that so that we can justify doing sin. We can justify living in our wrongness. And I'm telling you, it's actually in contradiction to what the Bible tells us. In Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5, David writes, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells in you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do inequity. It doesn't say that God loves the sinner and hates the sin. God loves those who have put their faith in Christ, who have been redeemed. God loves each and every one of us, but he's not going to let you live in your sin. This one here, I've heard this one actually uh, probably come out of my own mouth. I've heard it from uh, people here, people in our home church. Be in the world, not of the world. That's not in the Bible. It's, it's kind of emphasized in many places, but it's never stated in that way. Nowhere does it say that we're in the world, we're supposed to be here, but not be of it. Christ says in John 15 that, that we are not of the world. But nowhere does it say that we're supposed to be in it, but not of it. Again, that's a justification for doing the things that we know we shouldn't do. How about God will not give you more than you can handle? God will not give you more than you can handle. Job might like to argue that point with somebody. There is nothing in the Bible about that. It's a summation of 1 Corinthians 10, where it says that he won't tempt us in more. But yes, he will give us more than we can handle. Because if we could handle it all, we wouldn't need him. There'd be no need for God. We think we could do it all on our own. This one, God helps those who help themselves. You find that in First Americans 1776. God helps those who help themselves. Listen, that is the opposite of the gospel. That is completely the opposite of the gospel. God helps those who had no way of helping themselves. That's why he sent down his son. We had no way of being able to do the work that was needed to redeem us. We have no way to pull ourselves up out of the pits of our own sin and shame and despair. But now that is the American motto, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Work hard. You can get what you want. It's the opposite of the gospel. My grandmother used to say cleanliness is next to godliness. Lord have mercy, I'm not, I'm not very godly. So you don't need to laugh so hard. I mean, come on. So, <laughs> uh, thank God that's not in the Bible. I'm, I'm missing that one. Money is the root of all evil. The Bible says money is the root of all kinds of evil. But it is not the root of all evil. Sin is the root of all evil. Let's go back to the very beginning. Garden of Eden. What's Eve eat? What's she eat? A fruit. How many people have ever heard it's called the apple? Everybody says, oh, she ate the apple. The apple's not mentioned there at all. But people think that's in the Bible. They think that there was an apple that was eaten. Pride comes before the fall. No, pride goes before destruction. Seven deadly sins. Those aren't in the Bible. It actually came from Pope Gregory I in 600 AD. He compiled and said, these are the sins that God hates the most. God hates all sins. There aren't any that he hates the most. But that's not in there. But people think that there are seven deadly sins listed in the Bible. This next one, we sang about this here not too long ago. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that three kings went and saw a baby Jesus in a manger. It says that magi went, meant there was more than one. It said they took three gifts, but it doesn't say it was three kings that went there. And odds are, Christ wasn't even in the manger anymore at that point. It was long after that. But we sing about it every Christmas. 
we sing, we three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts. We come from afar. How about love is blind? Oh, love is blind. Many, many people use this, again, as a justification for doing what they want. Love is blind. It's okay. No, that's actually from Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, not from the Bible. The Bible tells us that love is patient and love is kind. But nowhere does it say love is blind. So why is that important? Why is it important that, that we, we talk about what's in the Bible? Because this is what God has given us so that we know God. This is how we know God. That's why we read our scriptures. That's why I'm encouraging you to take this time to read through all of this so that you can truly know God. Because if you don't, now you're believing in something that's not even in there. Now you're following something other than what God has said. And we want you to know God. We want you to be closer to Christ. We want you to know him. And you do that through reading of his word. And so we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at the importance of reading God's word and how that helps us to know God. And we're going to go back into the Old Testament, into uh, a lot of people's favorite books. We're going to be in 2 Kings. So go ahead and open up your Bibles, fire up your devices. The 2 Kings, chapter 22. I know I normally do that in the beginning. I'm a little behind. 20, we're going to be looking at chapters 22 and 23 today. And before we stand here for the reading of it, uh, the piece that we're going to read through, I want to just kind of give us a little uh, background. I like to help those who may not know uh, exactly what part of the Bible are in, what it's talking about, where we are in the timeline, and what these books are about. So Kings, there's First and Second Kings. That was actually one book. And it's very similar to First and Second Chronicles that follow it. And a lot of people have a hard time, and they have to slug through it because they don't understand just a whole lot of names. But so that we understand the difference, 1 Kings goes from the time of Solomon, 1 and 2 Kings are from the time of Solomon until Israel is cast into exile with Babylon. Now, Kings differs from Chronicles in that Kings talks about all the kings of Israel. At some point in the history, you'll read, there was a separation between the, the tribes, and 10 of the tribes went and became the northern kingdom. And so you'll see them referred to as the king of Israel in this part of the book. And they become the lost tribes of Israel as God casts them out. And then you see the two tribes that stayed together, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. They become the, they're referred to as the king of Judah most of the time. That's the southern tribes. Now the difference between this and Chronicles, Chronicles was written after the Babylon, they had come out of Babylonian captivity. And they're asking, is there anything for us? Does God still have a plan for us? And so this is the tribe of Judah. This is the tribe of Benjamin coming back. And so it's written from the point of view, this is what God has done through your kings all this time. And so they both tell a very similar story of Israel's history. You just see it from two different points of view. And so we're going to be in 2 Kings looking at this. And maybe in chapter 22, we're very near the end of Israel at this time. Actually, uh, where we're going to come in, we're about 36 years, I believe, 35 years from the fall. And we're going to read about a king by the name of Josiah. You see, as you read through these, as you read through kings, you see all these kings, and you see these kings that are often referred to. And they're always say, they, they always say the same thing about them. Matter of fact, back in 19, we'll just flip back. I don't think I have a slide for it. In 2219, uh, or 2119, talking about Amon, or 20, it says, He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Many of these kings said they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Israel had turned from God. They weren't in God's word. They weren't drawn near to him. They'd set up altars. They were worshiping Baal and Moloch, the Asherah. They had turned from all God had commanded. Remember, God had set Israel aside to be different from the nations that surround them, and they were looking just like them. And then we come in to this king, King Josiah. Josiah was very young. Josiah became king at eight years old. I know many people that shouldn't be kings at 80 years old. But he became king at eight years old. But Josiah was very different. Matter of fact, we read in verse 2, when it talks about him, it says, He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. Sammy, can you pull the background off, please? He did right in the sight of the Lord. 
Something came along that made him drastically different. As a matter of fact, the argument is very convincing that not only was he a good king, he was probably the greatest king that Israel ever had. The only problem was he came just a little too late in the lineage. This is the only time you will see where the writer says, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. Most of the other kings that you'll read, the few of them that say he did right, will say, but he left up the altars, or he kept going to the high places. Here it says he did right. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. So why is that? What made Josiah so different? He did so much during this time for Israel. He was crucial in the rebuilding. And they're, and they're coming back to the Lord. And he started eight years old. By 16, he had a heart that was pursuing God. By 20, he had already started reconstruction. By 26, the temple is completed. At the age of 26, he dies by the age of 39. He did so much from a young age because he was pursuing God. He knew God. But how does he know God when all the others didn't? Well, that's what we're going to read about. You see, it says that he's building a temple. He tells them to go get money. He sends somebody there at the end of of 22, uh, around verses 6 and 7. Go get money to pay the carpenters, pay the builders, pay all the masons for the work they're doing. Go get money out of the temple and pay them. And that brings us to our passage. So if you want to ask, would you please stand in honor of reading God's word, if you can. We're going to read verses 8 through 13. Beginning in verse 8, it says, Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, who read it. Shaphan the scribe came back to the king and brought back word to the king and said, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. Verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Achbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people of all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So, Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, speak into us today the importance of knowing you through your word. Use this time to draw us near to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So Josiah, we see something different with him. He'd sent them to go and to pay, to get the money to pay the workers. And he found something even greater there in the temple. It says there in the beginning in verse 8, he says, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. The book of the law, this was more than likely the book of Deuteronomy. They gave all the laws, everything they were to be doing, everything they were to follow. And they found it. It had been gone for years. They hadn't been reading it. They hadn't been seeing it. They didn't know it. And now this book has appeared for them. Where else would it be but in God's house? And he brings it to Hilkiah. He brings it to to Josiah. And he reads it to him. And when he does, he knows God. You see, that's what God's word does. It helps us to know him. It helps us to know him, we're going to see as we look at this passage, in three ways. Three ways we can know him. The first way is it helps us to know God's way. Reading God's word, reading the Bible helps us to know God's way. By his way, I mean it helps us to know his character. Helps us to know the character of God. He reads the word and says he tears his clothes off. This is a sign of humility as they rip their clothes off. They're in anguish over what's happening. It says that he tears his clothes off. Because the Bible, God, this, this, this gift that he has given us, it's our only way to truly know God's character. 
It's the only way to know him. As we read through it, we see God. We see a God who is more than just grace and mercy. Because that's what we want to stand on, and that's great. We need to stand on that. But we often, when we do, we, God becomes our buddy. God just becomes this buddy of ours, this genie that I can call on whenever I need something. And what we do is we lose the reverence that we should have for God. He gets reverence because he's read through this. He sees that not only is God graceful, does he see that God is merciful, see God is kind and God is loving. We also see that God is jealous. God is righteously vengeful. God has righteous anger. And God also has a limit. He is wrathful when you are disobedient. And he sees this and he becomes worried. He becomes concerned over what he's seeing. He's, he's truly seeing God's heart and he realizes we have not been doing what we're supposed to do. We have not been obeying God. We have not been obeying. And, and, and they would have known who God was. The stories were there, of course, of all the good things. We love to share the good things, the happy things that happen in our lives. We don't ever want to talk about the bad things. Ask anybody we had, that is a gambler. I had friends back in Kansas City. We had river boats. And they will tell you all the times they've won, but never once they tell you the times they lost. And so God had been remembered for the good things, and they forgot who he was. But reading his word, when we are in this, when we're reading through God's word, we come to see his ways, his character. We begin to have that reverence that we're supposed to have for him. We see that, that we need to respect him as as. Our children are to respect us, not out of a place of fear of cowering, but a fear of that they are the ones in authority. And yes, they love me. Yes, they, they, they want to show kindness to me, but I know there's only so far I can push. My kids know there's a point they can go before, as, as one of my sons said, your voice drops eight octaves. And when the dad voice comes out, we know it's time to stop. That reverence, it's there. Wish they'd find it before I hit the eighth octave, but won't first or second octave be a good spot, if not before then. But when we're reading God's word and we come to know God, we need to make sure that we are truly understanding it in the right way. It can become so easy for us to misinterpret God's word. So we need to make sure that when we're doing it, we're seeking the wisdom of others. We're asking friends, we're asking our pastors, other Christians, to make sure we understand what's being written there. I do that every time I write. I, I, I compose a sermon. I look, at, I look at what others have said before. I talk to other pastors and I say, hey, help me to understand this. I'll make sure I've got this right. We see this with Josiah. As he comes to know God, he wants to make sure that his understanding of God and God's character is correct. And so in verse 13, he tells them to go inquire of the Lord for me and all the people of Judah concerning these words of this book that have been found. He's like, I want to make sure I'm right because it doesn't look very good if I'm wrong. I need to make sure I'm right in this. And you need to make sure when you're reading through it, you're going to read through a lot of stuff. As you're going through the Bible in six months, you're going to read through a lot of stuff. And while it's all applicable to us, it's not all directly relevant to us. And I want to help you understand what that means. Because people say, oh, no, the whole Bible is relevant. It is. It's applicable. But it's not all directly to us we got to make sure we take in the right context. You remember, this is a book that's written over thousands of years to, to people that lived very differently than we did. Christians love to quote Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And we love to quote that, say, see, God wants good things for me. Prosperity gospel will tell you, see, God wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to have good things. I got bad news for you, Christians, and don't get mad at me. That verse was not written for you. That verse is not about any one of us in here. It shows God's character. God has a plan for us. He does have a plan for us for the ultimate welfare of a relationship with him. But that was written to people that were in exile in Babylon, People that had been cast away by God into the, the hands of, of their enemies. It was not written towards us. We can't take that and say that directly applies to us. We need to seek that counsel to make sure that we're interpreting it right. Because if we're going to 
we're going to quote this one for us. You need to just turn back a few more chapters and go to 44. When you have another group of exiles, those who had left and gone to Egypt, but they weren't supposed to, and God says to them, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm going to set my face against you for woe, even to cut off all of Judah. God says, I'm going to smack you down. But we don't want to quote that one for us. We don't want to apply that to us. Why not? We can't just have the good. We have to apply it all and understand it in the right context. So when you're reading through God's word, when you're going through these, especially in these, these older sections, understand who it was written to. Understand how it's written. And discern for it the parts that are applicable to, to us directly because it helps us to know God. Reading God's word helps us to know his ways. We know God's ways, his desires. The second way that we know God as we read through God's word is reading God's word lets us know, reading the Bible lets us know God's word. And by his word, it's his expectations. We get to know God's word. We get to know his expectations. We get to know what he expects from us. You see, Josiah, he sends them out. He says, I want you to go talk to the prophetess. And that's an interesting that you read that piece there. It shows humility. Because he sent the people to go talk to the prophetess when at this time he would have had Isaiah, he would have had Jeremiah, he would have had Nahum, he would have had Habakkuk, he could have gone ask. But he sends it to this prophetess to say, are we right in this? What does God say about what's happening with us? As I've read these words, what are his expectations for us? And she says, yes, that God says in 16, behold, I bring evil on this place and on the inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read to me, 17, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. God, she says, yes, God says, you guys have done wrong. You have not met his expectations. God had gave them rules. God had set them apart, and he told them when he did, you're not going to have other gods. You're not going to have false idols. You're not supposed to marry the people in the land that you're going into. You're supposed to be so different. And here he says, you've forsaken me. You have forsaken me. You see, reading through God's word helps us to know what his expectations are. The Bible guides us in a world that's filled with false teachings. This would have been all they would have known. They had been worshiping Baal, and they had been worshiping the Asherah and, and Molech for so long. They had been burning incense in the high places for so long. It's all they would have known. But God's word helps us to see what his expectations are. And that's what we need to look at. We need to see what God's expectations are, not our expectations, because so often we try to make the two work, and that means we start disregarding pieces of God's word. We start casting it aside. I'm here to tell you what. You cannot reconcile man's expectations with God's expectations unless man's expectations are God. You can't reconcile man's expectations with God's expectations unless your expectations are for God. It's the only way it works. You can't make the two work otherwise, but we see it time and time again as we see churches that are not preaching the gospel, churches that are not telling people what sin are. They don't even want to use the word sin because it might offend somebody. And so they start making these, these adjustments and concessions. And the next thing you know, they're no longer even resembling a church. And they're leading people down a road that leads straight to hell because they don't know God. They don't know what his expectations are. And look, I'm not going to pick on, I'm not trying to pick on any one, but one that is so crucial. You cannot reconcile LGBTQ with God's word. It cannot be done. I'm not trying to be mean or hateful, but so many churches are trying to do it. And you can't read through God's word and reconcile it. You cannot bring the two together. One is man's desire, and one is God's. But we try to bring them together. God's word shows us what his expectation is. He told them they weren't doing it. They weren't going where they were supposed to. They weren't doing the things they were supposed to. 
You see, the Bible, this gift of God, written over all these years, compiled into one handy-dandy book, is the instructions for our life. This is the instruction book. Like God didn't just put us here and say, good luck. And I know many of you are probably like me. When you get something, the first thing you do is you get rid of the instruction book. I don't need that. I've done construction for 25 years. I don't need instruction booklets. And then I build it. I have leftover parts. That means I improved on their design. I got news. You can't improve on God's design. You can't improve on his plans. You can't take and leave stuff out and think it's better. It's not. You can't add stuff to it and make it better either. It is what guides us. God gave them the instructions from the beginning in the Ten Commandments. He gave them the Ten Commandments. And what's the first one? No other gods before me. And they had other gods. They weren't meeting his expectations. The first five we talked about, remember the first five of the Ten Commandments, tell us how to love God. How to be in a relationship with him. The last five tell us how to love others. How to be in a relationship with people. Christ says, I'm going to make it simple on you. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your spirit. No, I'm in the wrong order there, but that's okay. That's the first and foremost commandment. He says, love people as you love yourself. In them, all of the law is fulfilled. Christ says, that's simple. God's given you the instructions for your life. But yet we want to try and reconcile what we want with what God wants, what our expectations are with him. And you can't do it. When we do, what we're doing is we're trying to reconcile the deeds of the flesh. We're trying to bring the deeds of the flesh into the picture, the things that we want. You remember they're there in, in Galatians. If I can find the right tab here. Galatians 5. Paul says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmities, and it goes on and on. You can't be drunk all the time and reconcile that with what God's Word says. You can't live a life where you're out gallivanting with the opposite sex, where you are committing adultery, where you are being angry and reconcile that with God's Word. You're not, you don't know what his expectations are. But God's told us what they are. And yes, we're going to slip. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. But God's told us what he expects out of us. And we can only know that when we read God's word. How do you know what you don't know? We don't. I've had people say, oh, I, I've never read the Bible, but I believe it. What do you know what you're believing? Don't, I don't sign a contract without reading this is a big contract. This is a big thing that God did, man. You better make sure you know what the cost is, what the price is, what God expects out of us. And so when we read through his word, we get to know his expectations. So now we know his character. We see who God is. We know his, his word. We know what his expectations are. And the third way we know God as we read the Bible is we know his will. We know God's will. We know what his desire is. You see, the Bible... It equips us to serve God. It equips us to do all that God requires from us. We see that as we're going to run through this pretty quick. Here as we read through 23, jump through 23, we see now he has seen what God expects out of them. And he's like, we have missed some mark. I mean, that's what sin means. You've missed some mark. He says, we have missed some mark. And Josiah starts making some changes. In verse 4, it says that he commanded that they get out of the temple all the vessels made for Baal. And that's right. He says, get them out. We're not supposed to worship other gods. they got to go. Get rid of them. He casts out the idolatrous priests in chapter 5. He says, they got to go. We can't have them either. This is not what God's expectations are. And so now God's equipped him to do what his desires are, to get rid of these things. Brought out the Asherah. In verse 7, he broke down the houses which the male cult prostitutes which were in the house of the Lord. There were prostitutes living in the temple. And he says, they got to go. That is so far against what God's will is. That's not what his expectations are. His desires is that we get rid of them. Verse 10, he also defiled Topheth. This was the, the Moloch. This is where they were casting their kids into to sacrifice, causing them to walk through the fire. God doesn't want human sacrifice. 
So he sees what God's will and desires. And it goes on and on. He breaks altars. He casts away horses that were offered up to the sun. He, he does all these things. He reinstitutes the Passover. Because he has read God's word, he knows what God's will is. He knows what his desire is. And it has equipped him to move forward, to do what God wants. Christian, you know what God's desire is. You know what his expectations are for you. His expectations are that you sin no more that you repent, you come to him, and then that you go and you share the gospel. He wants the kingdom to grow. His expectation is for that. And so that has equipped us to pivot from sin. When we see we've done wrong, when we see we're going against what God's words, we pivot from and come back to him. And then we go and we share the good news of the gospel with a world that needs it so bad. A world that needs to know what God's character is, needs to know what God's expectations are, and needs to know what his desires are. And so he's equipped you as you read through this, just like he had done with Josiah. He'd equipped him. And we see in verse 25 of chapter 23 why he was such a great king. It says, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after Why was he such a great king? Because he read God's word and he knew God. He knew God through the word he'd given him. He didn't say, I need God to come down here and appear before me and prove himself to me. He says, I know God. And there was no king like him who turned to the Lord. Because he knew him. How do we know God? We read the Bible. And so as we wrap up here, I want to give us three applicable ways that we can read our Bible. As you're reading through it, three things I want you to consider each time you sit down before God's Word to read it. To encourage you, to equip you, and to guide you. One, we read the Bible with confidence. We read it with confidence. This is the inerrant Word of God, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, given to us, and it is provable, it is testable, and it is without flaw. I've had so many people say, oh, the Bible, it's full of errors. And every time they do, I say, oh, can you show me one? Oh, the Bible, it's it's full of inconsistency, it contradicts itself. Can you show me a contradiction? Show me somewhere where the Bible is flawed. Listen, every time somebody tries to prove the Bible wrong, all they ever do is they prove it right. Every time it proves itself correct. Oh, there's no records of a King David anywhere. Archaeological sites have recently been discovered that talk about a King David over in Israel. Oh, there's nothing that shows uh, there was ever a mass exodus and that they went and they, these Hebrews gathered around a mountain. Actually, in your Bible, and I've talked about this before, the map shows the wrong spot. They have now found the Mount of Mosul. So over in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabians have put fences around to keep people out. And around there, around the bottom of there are 12 pillars set up that have Hebrew and Egyptian hieroglyphics on it. And the top of it's scorched black. Sounds kind of familiar. Oh, well, there's, there's no proof that, that God parted the sea and they went through the Red Sea. Actually, they have now found... In this spot that leads toward the Mount of Mosul, there's this place in the Red Sea where actually it is shallower than the rest of the Red Sea. And in that, as they've gone down and they have seen in dives, there are coral beds that are shaped with spokes like Egyptian wheels. Every time they try to disprove the Bible, all they ever do is prove right. So we can read it with confidence knowing it is true. We can trust it. We can put our faith in what it says. It's going to guide us. As a matter of fact, that's number two. We can read it with anticipation. We can read the Bible. Because we can read it with confidence, we can read it with anticipation. It has the answer to every question that we will ever have in life. It answers all the important questions we have. Let me put that that way. It answers the important questions we have in life. Why am I here? What, there's got to be more to life than this. Why, why is there pain? Why is there suffering? It answers the question of what is the meaning of life. And I'm here to tell you, it's not 42. And if you get that reference, you and I can be friends. 
It tells us everything we need to know. As a matter of fact, many of your Bibles are probably like mine. And in the back, there's a section that says, what to read when I'm feeling alone. What to read when I'm feeling sorrow. What to read when I feel like pride is coming on. What do I do when I think there's no hope? It has the answers to everything you need. But you've got to read it. You've got to be in it. And so we read it with anticipation. Because we can read it with confidence, we read it with anticipation that God is going to answer the questions we have. And ultimately, that means the third way we read it is we read it with longing. We read it with longing. Listen, the Bible is so important that Christ said we can't survive without it. Christ says we cannot live without God's word. Christ is out in the wilderness. Forty days, he's still human. He's hungry. The enemy comes and tempts him, says, turn these stones. If you're the son of man, turn them into bread. And what's Christ say in Matthew 4.4? 4? It is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible sustains us. God's word fills us to overflowing with the knowledge of our creator. And that's why we read the Bible with confidence, we read it with anticipation, and we read it with longing, knowing that it's going to guide us, and it's going to fill us with everything that we need. It is the way we know our Creator. And so I want to encourage you to keep moving forward. This first week, we have seen so much of God's character. Uh, as we have gone through, we've seen from creation to His, His grace that He poured on sinners right in the very beginning, We've seen the promises as he's made, his wrath. We've seen his anger. We've seen his promises that he's given to Abraham, to Noah. The promises that he has continued to pour onto even sons that are deceitful. Sons that trick their own family members. We've seen so much of God's character and it's just starting. So I encourage you to keep going through it. Keep reading with anticipation that he's going to answer your questions and longing to let it fill you up. The greatest piece of the Bible is that it contains the hope that we have. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The Bible has the gospel. It's a book about Jesus. And that's what I want to share with you guys now. As I do at the end of every service, I want you guys to know the gospel. And that's that you were created on purpose and for a great purpose. Purpose is not to be rich, not to travel around the world. Purpose was to have a relationship with God. But unfortunately, because of sin, sin that came into this world through Adam and Eve and has progressed through every generation to each one of us now, we're separated from a holy and perfect God. But God, in all his loving wisdom, saw our greatest need, and that was for a Savior. So at just the right moment in time, he sent down his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin and do the thing we could not do. He lived a sinless life. Christ walked for 30 years sinlessly, and he went to the cross. He went to the cross to bear the wrath of God for your sins and for mine. Christ died, he was buried, and he arose on the third day, proving he was who he says he was, and he could do what he says he could do, and he defeated death once and for all. The Bible tells us if you profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you too will be saved. Has the answer to all life's problems. And it begins with the gospel. He's suffering with pain. He's suffering with shame. He's suffering with, with humiliation of wherever your life is. You don't know where to go. Go to Christ. He's the answer to every problem you've got. He's offering you eternal life through faith. He's willing to bear the burden of your sin, but you've got to give it up. You can't hold on to it. You can't reconcile your expectations with his. God expects that you're going to give it all to him. You're going to give every bit of that sin to him. Hand it all over. Don't hold on to any of it. Let Christ have it. He's the only one who can carry it. We weren't meant to carry that. We were not created to bear that burden. If you've never put your faith in Christ, there's no better time than today. As you're beginning this path of spiritual fitness, begin by getting that weight off of you. Get rid of that burden. 
come to the altar, hand it all over to Christ, and receive the amazing free gift of salvation. And from there, you will truly come to know God. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to sing our last hymn. If you've got any prayers, any questions, if you want to visit, come up and see me up here. Don't be afraid to come up uh, or catch me after service. I'd love to be able to visit with you. But I want to encourage you guys, don't stop reading God's word. Know God. Truly know who he is through his scripture. Let me pray. Father, graceful Lord, I thank you for, for the gift of your word. Lord, I thank you for the scriptures, the, the, the thing that you gave to us to guide us in this, this world. In a world that's trying to pull us away from you, you've given us the instruction booklet to guide us back towards you. Lord, we know ultimately we can't do any of it without Christ. So I pray for maybe those in here today or online who hear this message that have never put their faith in Christ. And they're trying to reconcile all this. Lord, let them first come to know their Savior. I pray your Holy Spirit would wrestle on them. I pray that today would be the day that they hand it all over and say, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. God, I want what you want. I can't mess my life up anymore, but I know you can make it better. So, Father, I pray that today is the day. And Lord, for those of us who have put our faith in you, Lord, let us draw near to you. You have given us the instructions. We can read it with confidence knowing that it is true. We can read it with anticipation knowing it's going to answer every question we have and we can read it with longing knowing that it fills us. Lord, we want to know you. We want to know what your character is. We want to know what your expectations are and we want to know what your desires are because we know that everything that you have is for our good. We know that you want the good things in our lives. So, Lord, guide us. As we read through these passages, as we continue in this reading plan, I pray that each one of us are drawn closer to you, that they might know you better. You are such a good and loving God. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. Thank you for doing the work that we could not do, Lord Jesus. The only one who is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb, not us. And so, Lord, as we continue to walk this path, let us remain faithful to what you have called us to do. We know your expectations. Let us remain faithful. Let us pursue your desires. You have equipped us. Let us make disciples. Present opportunities for us to be a witness here in our town, in our neighborhood, with our neighbors, with our coworkers. Lord, that they may all know the name of Jesus Christ. That they may all call on him. We pray for our cities. Hooksett and Bow and Auburn, Manchester, all the surrounding towns, Lord, that you would spread like a wildfire and we would see revival here. Lord, let us remain faithful to all you have called us to do until you return, Lord Jesus, or you call us home. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Please stand as we sing our final hymn.
Miss Linda, would you come up and give the closing benediction? Father, we come to you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, who is the word. We thank you that we can know you and that these are the very words that you speak, that the word is you. Amen. We praise you and thank you for um, meeting with us, for showing us who you are, for the way that your word is living. Um, and we pray that you would breathe this life into us as we talk with you, we meet with you there. There's nothing better, Lord, in the whole world than to have you meet with us and to encounter you and to know that you're speaking with us. And so we ask you, God, to help us to hear you, um, quiet our hearts when we open your word, that we would hear your whispers, um, that we would know what you're speaking to us about, and that we would um, have that oneness with you that you so desire. We thank you for loving us, for giving us Jesus, for um, his death on the cross that has made um, a relationship like this with you possible. We praise you and thank you for Jesus. In his name, amen. You have a blessed weekend.